Okay, in part two of our three-part series on influenza, we're going to take a look at the structure, the physical nature of the influenza virion, the individual virus particle. What you see in this image here is influenza A, one of the more common broad categories of influenza viruses. They look all big and squishy because they have uh, an envelope around them. And we know that the envelope is not going to be a, a hard structure. And so it's going to look all squishy. What I want you to do right now is take a look at the, the diagram that I, I took from the textbook in the bottom right and look at the different pieces and parts uh, involved in an influenza virus. In fact, something big uh, and important is missing from this sketch. I, I didn't notice it till I put it in here, but I thought I'd leave it in and let you do a little detective work. What, um, what key component of the influenza virion is missing from the little cartoon drawing in the bottom right. Now I do want you to know the envelope, the uh, neuraminidase and hemagglutinin we're going to talk about. We'll talk briefly about the viral RNA polymerase. Don't worry so much about the endonuclease uh, and we will talk about the RNA genome, the eight segmented, um, eight segment segmented RNA genome. So let's go ahead and jump in and start looking at some of these pieces here. We'll start with the capsid. Capsids for uh, influenza viruses can be either um, uh, icosahedral or they can be helical. Uh, icosahedron seems to be most common. Helical is not in the least bit uncommon. It really depends on the specific strain of influenza that we're talking about. Now within a given strain you're not going to have some virions bursting out of a cell that are icosahedron and others that are bursting out of a cell that are helical. For a given strain it'll be genetically determined which of these two uh, capsid symmetries um, is, is going to um, is going to be produced, but we call this condition pleomorphic, as in many shapes, different possible capsid symmetries, in this case, there being two. So you see the, the poly polyhedron uh, in the top, and on the bottom you can see the, the sketch of an enveloped helical influenza virus there. Uh, either of those is absolutely possible when it comes to, uh, comes to influenza. The spikes on the surface of the envelope, remember this is an enveloped virus, and enveloped viruses have spikes on their surface, and the spikes are proteins or glycoproteins. They're typically referred to as surface antigens. The term antigen means something that generates an antibody response. In other words, a molecule that our immune systems can recognize. So it makes sense that the spikes would be considered surface antigens because our immune system is not going to see what's below the surface of that envelope. And so our immune system can see the hemagglutinin and the neuraminidase spikes that are on that surface. Uh, they're both tricky words, both to spell and to pronounce. So practice spelling them out a few times and practice pronouncing them properly a few times. Hemagglutinin and neuraminidase. You can tell the second one's going to be an en enzyme because it has ASC ending. And the top one is a non-enzyme protein. That IN ending tells you it's a protein, it's not an enzyme. So hemagglutinin, what is this? These are attachment proteins. They recognize a particular carbohydrate on the epithelium of our respiratory tract. So our respiratory epithelial cells have a lot of this carbohydrate called sialic acid on the surface. Hemagglutinin is a protein that will chemically grab onto that sialic acid and latch on, and that initiates the process of infection. If you go to another tissue that doesn't have sialic acid, the influenza variants are just gonna wash right over it and keep on going. This is almost like um, almost like magnetism, almost like magnets grabbing onto one another. And so the hemagglutinin will grab onto the sialic acid and locate them uh, wherever our sialic acid can be found. And it's found on all of our epithelial tissues, but our respiratory tract epithelium is the most enriched in, in um, sialic acid. Neuraminidase, on the other hand, is an enzyme that can break down sialic acid as well as possibly some other components of the extracellular matrix. Now remember what the extracellular matrix is. In humans, we do not have a cell wall. And so to provide some structural support to our tissues, um, uh, particularly at the outer surfaces of tissues, we have an extracellular material. It's almost a gelatin-like material that's made up of long fibers of polysaccharides and proteins that helps to provide some cushioning, some support, and some, some structural uh, integrity to a tissue to keep it from getting damaged. It also means that it's hard for some viruses to get in in the first place. Uh, 
and those that do get in, it's hard for them to get out again. So we know for sure that neuraminidase is essential for the release of these new variants from a virus, uh, pardon me, a, a eukaryotic cell that has been producing uh, influenza viruses. Um, as they are ready to begin budding out, if they're near the surface of the tissue, they can be pinned in by that, um, by that uh, extracellular matrix. We know for sure that neuraminidase is essential for allowing them to chew their way through the extracellular matrix and spread to new hosts. <clears throat> it's also postulated that it may be important for getting into some of these cells in the first place. If extracellular matrix is a factor, they may be able to literally chew their way through, make a little slushy spot, move their way to the surface, fuse the membranes, and uh, the nucleocapsid can enter. Now, neuraminidase is not unique to influenza. There are several different viruses that have it, and you can see why, but neuraminidase is a key part of what's on the surface in those spikes in, uh, in the influenza variants. And both of these, the hemagglutinin and the neuraminidase, are typically what um, tips off our immune system to an influenza infection. Uh, currently, there are about 15 different hemagglutinin types, so slightly slight variations on the protein sequence. We, you could think of them as a family, right? So there's the H1 hemagglutinin. Now, there are some variations within H1. Not every hemagglutinin 1 uh, type 1 is going to be exactly the same, but there's uh, hemagglutinin type 1 through hemagglutinin type 15, and there are nine different known neuraminidases, uh, N1 through N9. And we can generally label a particular influenza strain by its hemagglutinin type and its neuraminidase type. So you've heard of H5N1, for example. That's a very important bird flu virus. Uh, in human population, we often see H1N1, H1N2, and H3N2. Now, within a given uh, uh, category, say H1N1, there's still going to be some variation. Some strains will be more virulent than others and so on, but they're going to have uh, certain properties in common with one another. So it gives you a little bit of a sense of, of how difficult it is to, to uh, keep track of these different varieties. There are many, many different versions of, uh, of influenza viruses out there, and they change and drift and shift, as we'll talk about shortly. <clears throat> now, the last piece to this story I want to talk about uh, in terms of structure is the genome. We've talked about how viruses can have an RNA genome or a DNA genome, and it can be single-stranded or double-stranded. Influenza is a great example of a single-stranded RNA genome. Now, in many cases, viral genomes, there's just a single chromosome in there. In the case of influenza, though, there are actually eight segments. Uh, you could think of them as eight separate chromosomes, but they're very, very small. Each one of those eight, quote-unquote, chromosomes only codes for a single gene. There's only one gene coded on there. Stop for a minute and think about that. Right? The human genome, something like 23 to 25,000 genes. E. coli is somewhere around 5,000 genes. Influenza, eight. Right, these are very, very simple little infectious structures. You can see why people aren't quite sure what to do with them in terms of whether they should be considered alive or not. And they range from 890 nucleotides to 2,341 nucleotides at the largest. Now, six of those eight, think this through, maybe grab a piece of paper and sketch this out as we talk about this. Six of those RNA segments each just code for one gene. <clears throat> Two segments have just a single gene coded on them, but it's a gene that can undergo something called alternative splicing. Now, if you remember when we talked about uh, transcription and translation in eukaryotes, we talked about splicing, removing introns, stitching exons back together. And it turns out that there are some introns in these last two RNA segments in influenza that can either be left in or taken out in different combinations. And so you've really got two different possible gene products from any one gene from those two segments. So those two segments code for uh, a gene as is, but then a gene alternatively spliced that would lead to a different version of the protein product. So in the end, think about this. In the end, that means there are 10 proteins, 10 unique proteins being made. Not very many, but, um, but there are 10, and you can see how that happens 
six, one, one gene each, and two of them that can undergo alternative splicing and ultimately create two possible transcripts and therefore two possible proteins each. <clears throat> now this last piece is important, and we'll talk about this uh, a little bit more on the next uh, video, but it's important to understand that it would be an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase that the virus has to bring with it that is going to replicate the genome of influenza, right? And think about why that is. It comes in with single-stranded RNA. It needs to make more copies of that during the biosynthesis phase in order to make new variants. But the, the RNA polymerase that you and I have is DNA dependent. It has to read DNA in order to make an RNA. We don't have an RNA polymerase that can read an RNA template. And so the influenza virus, like other RNA viruses, has to bring its own RNA dependent RNA polymerase. Now one key feature, a distinction between DNA polymerases and RNA polymerases. DNA polymerases have something called proofreading activity, meaning that after they put a nucleotide in and they base pair with a template and they add a nucleotide to the new growing strand, they can actually check the fit. They can double check to make sure that they put the right one there. So if the template had a T and the DNA polymerase puts an A, it double checks it, makes sure that it's the right fit before it moves on again. RNA polymerases do not have proofreading activity, which means that at some low frequency, they're going to introduce errors. That's at a much higher frequency than the error rate of DNA polymerase. Because of that, RNA-based genomes, these viral genomes like influenza, can mutate much more rapidly. That becomes really important in uh, understanding the diversity of, of influenza viruses, as well as why we need a new vaccine year after year after year. So we're going to talk about this idea of antigenic drift and a related idea of antigenic shift on the next video. So I hope this was helpful. I hope you'll play it back multiple times. Make sure all your questions are answered. Um, if between the video and, uh, and the book you're not able to get your questions answered, feel free to give me a call or stop by my office and we can talk about it.